you listened to the last radio program, you'll remember that I spent some time discussing such terms as arc and path and directed path and contour. And I explained the difference between all these terms. And I also spent some time showing you how to integrate along such things as arcs and paths and contours. Well, today I'm going to take a slightly different point of view. I'm going to assume that you understand these basic definitions. And today I'm going to look at techniques. In other words, if you're actually given an integral, how do you go about evaluating it? Well, on the board over here, I've got some integrals written up. So why don't we go across and look at them? Well, as you can see, I've got three integrals written up. And at first sight, they all look much the same. They all have the form, the integral round C, where C is the unit circle. And they all have the form, the integral of 1 over z plus something. Well, I'm going to try and solve all these things. And as you'll see later in the program, the techniques that I use for evaluating this one don't work when it comes to this one. The technique I use for evaluating this one doesn't work when it comes to this one. So one of the morals of this program is that whenever you've got techniques which help you solve integrals, if these techniques don't work, then we just have to bring in more theorems. We have to bring in more theory to enable us to evaluate integrals. Well, let's, let's stop philosophizing. Let's, let's go right ahead and look at the first one. The first one is the integral of 1 over z dz taken around the unit circle. It's one you've seen before. And the way we do it is we parametrize the unit circle. If we take some parametrization, like e to the i t is the familiar one, then as t goes from 0 to 2 pi, then we go round the unit circle. And how do we actually evaluate this integral? Well, we just plug in the parametrization. We've got the integral round c. That's the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And then we've got a z on the bottom. That's e to the i t. And then the dz just becomes i e to the i t dt. Well, this particular example is very simple. We've got an e to the i t here, an e to the i t here. So they cancel. Just leaving i integrated from 0 to 2 pi, which is 2 pi i. Well, there are two things I want you to notice about this. And let's go back to our circle to see what they are. We chose our parametrization e to the i t as t goes from 0 to 2 pi in such a way that we go exactly once around the unit circle and we go around anti-clockwise. And this is the convention that we'll always take when integrating round simple closed contours. And the reason for this is that if we take other parametrizations which take us several times round or backwards or something like that, then in general, we may get different answers. If we choose the parametrization t goes to e to the i t, then as t increases steadily from 0 to 2 pi, the image point moves anti-clockwise round the circle. The numbers you see appearing are, of course, the corresponding values of t. Let's see that again, and this time notice that because we chose e to the i t, the point moves with constant speed. As we saw earlier, the integral of 1 over z along this arc is just 2 pi i. If we now take e to the 3 i t as our parametrization, then as t goes from 0 to 2 pi, the point moves around the circle three times. As you can see, it goes around with constant speed again. Since we've gone around three times, the value of the integral is now 6 pi i. And with t goes to e to the n i t, it would be 2 n pi i. What happens if we take t goes to e to the minus i t?
Well, this time the point goes clockwise. And what's the value of the integral? It's just minus 2 pi i. Finally, let's take this parametrization. As you can see, this time the point's not going at constant speed. But despite this, the value of the integral is still 2 pi i. So as you've just seen, if we stick to our two conventions, that we go round just once and in an anti-clockwise direction, then we always get the right answer 2 pi i. But if we break these conventions, if we go round several times or backwards, then we usually get a different answer. Well, let's now go on to our second problem, which is the integral of 1 over z plus 2 around the unit circle. And as you might expect, we can go, we can bash straight on. And let's just parametrize as we did before and see what happens. We get the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And then putting in e to the i t, e to the i t plus 2. And then the dz is i e to the i t dt. But this time, there's a 2 here, so we don't get cancel cancellation. We've run into problems. What are we going to do in this case? Well, there are various possibilities. One thing that we could do is to split this integral into real and imaginary parts. But then, instead of having one complicated integral, we have two complicated integrals. And in any case, I think it's a lot more elegant if we can solve the problem by arguing from the original integral, which involves the complex variable z, instead of splitting it into some integrals involving real variables. So let's go back to our original integral and see how we, how we could argue from this one directly. Well, if this were m231, you'd know how to proceed. If this were 1 over x plus 2, then you say, well, it's easy. We just integrate, and we get log of x plus 2. Well, let's see if we can do the same thing here we ought to be able to write what the integral of 1 over z plus 2 is log of z plus 2 taken around the contour. And then since it's a closed contour, we will get 0. Now the question is, can we do this? Is there a theorem which says that we can get from here down to here just by integrating straight away? And the answer is yes, there is a theorem which you should have met in unit four. It's called the fundamental theorem. The fundamental theorem says that the integral round any simple closed contour of f dashed z dz is just zero as long as two conditions are satisfied. First of all, that f is analytic, and secondly, that f dashed is continuous. Well, what happens in this particular case? Here is f dashed, it's this function here, and here is f. And we've got to check that this is continuous and that this is analytic. So let's do this. How about this one? 1 over z plus 2, is that continuous? Well, the only place it could go wrong is at the point minus 2. But the point minus 2 is so far away from the contour that there's no trouble at all. This function is continuous. Everything's all right. So we've now got to look at this. We've got to check that this is analytic, and in fact that it's defined. Well, this will be the principal value of log, which is defined in the cut plane. So we've got to put an, in a cut, and the cut will go from the point minus 2. It'll go off to the left, like that. And as you can see, the cut stays well clear of the contour, so we have no problems. This is defined, and it's analytic. So we've checked the two conditions, that this is continuous, and this is analytic. So the fundamental theorem applies, and so we've got our answer, that this is equal to this, which is just, which is just zero. So in this case, everything's all right. But some of you may be wondering whether we could have done the same thing with the first example. In this first example, we had the integral of 1 over z. Why can't we just say this is just the integral of log of z? 
which is then equal to zero? Well, the answer we got was 2 pi i, so that we know that something's obviously wrong. And what's wrong is that the conditions of the fundamental theorem don't in fact apply. After all, if we integrate this to get log of z, we've got to check that log of z is analytic. But log of z is only defined in the cut plane, and the cut this time goes from naught. So if we make that cut, the cut gets right in the way of the contour, and so we can't integrate around the contour. So log is not analytic, and we can't use the fundamental theorem. Whereas, as I remarked before, with this example, the two conditions were satisfied. The fundamental theorem does apply in this second case, and we get the answer zero. Well, I'm now going to make a slight change to this problem. I'm going to generalize it slightly. And instead of taking the unit circle, I'm going to take some other shapes. Let's take this triangle, for example, and we'll assume that it doesn't contain the point minus 2. And the question is, can we do exactly the same sort of procedure for this integral, which is the integral around the triangle of 1 over z plus 2? We want to be able to write that this integral is just log of z plus 2 taken around the contour, which again is 0 because the contour is closed. And the question is, can we write this equals this equals this? And to check, we've just got to check the conditions of the fundamental theorem. Well, first of all, there's this one. Is it continuous? Well, it is continuous because the only awkward point is minus 2, which is way away from the contour. And secondly, we've got to check that this is analytic, but it certainly is because the cut goes from minus 2 off to the left. It doesn't interfere with the contour, and so everything is all right. So with this triangle, instead of the circle, everything works out all right. And we could have done exactly the same without, with all sorts of other contours. Supposing we'd taken an ellipse, which didn't contain the point minus 2. Then we could have gone through exactly the same procedure. And we could have taken a square, or we could have taken a pentagon, or any other sort of convex region like these. And in each case, we could have gone through the same procedure, checking the two conditions for the fundamental theorem, and everything would have been all right. The only time you get into trouble is if you had some rather complicated thing like this. Supposing we have something like this, and supposing the point minus 2 is here. Then you go through the procedure that you had before until you try to draw the cut. Now, if you start from here, you can't draw a cut which gets from here to the outside world because the contour gets in the way. So in this case, we'd be stuck. But in fact, even in this case, as we'll see later in the course, you can apply the fundamental theorem. Later in the course, we'll show you how to get around this difficulty. Anyway, we're not going to be concerned with that now. Let's go back to our examples, and let's look at the third example. The third example went round the unit circle. We're back to the unit circle again. And this time, it's 1 over zeta minus a half d zeta. And as you notice, I've changed from z's to zetas. The reason for this is to fit in rather better with the notation of unit 5. Well, if we look at this integral, we might try and evaluate it using the techniques we've already used. But if we try parametrization, if we put in e to the i t, then this half is going to get in the way again, and we won't have cancellation, and everything goes wrong, just as it did before. So parametrization's not going to work. So the next thing to try is obviously the fundamental theorem. Well, does the fundamental theorem work? We've got two conditions to check. First of all, is this continuous? And secondly, is the log analytic? Well, log of zeta minus a half, well, is that even defined? Where's the cut going to be? Well, the cut is going to go from a half off to the left. And so, as you can see, the cut is going to interfere with the contour. So that condition isn't satisfied, let alone the other one. So we can't use the fundamental theorem. So all the techniques that we've used so far, they all break down. And we've got to find some way of getting around this. And the way we get around it is to introduce another theorem. 
And the result that we're going to introduce is called Cauchy's formula. Well, this is Cauchy's formula here, and it says that 2 pi i times f of z is equal to the integral round c of this rather complicated looking expression. Now, in this formula, c is any closed circle, and z is any point inside it. So, we've got it written up here. It doesn't look very revealing, but let's look at it again. 2 pi i times f of z, z is any point inside the circle, and it's equal to this. What it's really saying is that you can express f of any point inside the circle in terms of the values of f at these zetas, the points on the contour. In other words, if you know f of all the points on the contour, you can actually calculate f of any point inside. This is really quite a remarkable result, and you'll see it over and over again right through the course. So the sooner you get used to it, the better. Well, how does it help us with our particular problem? Can you see any link between Cauchy's formula here and our particular example? Well, we can do this easily enough by taking z equals a half, and then we've got to get rid of this f of zeta, and we can do that by defining f to be the function which sends every point to 1. So zeta minus z becomes zeta minus a half, and on the top, we just get 1. So this is the integral we want. And what's it equal to? It's just 2 pi i times f of z. But f sends everything to 1, so it's just equal to 2 pi i times 1. The value of this integral is just 2 pi i. Well, you may be asking where Cauchy's formula actually came from. And what we're going to do now is to show you a bit of film which proves Cauchy's theorem Cauchy's formula, but only in the special case of the example we're looking at. We're actually going to prove, using the proof you'll see in the unit, that this is equal to 2 pi i. So we start off by taking the unit circle, and we've got the point a half already marked. What we're going to do is to show that the integral around the unit circle is the same as the integral taken around a small circle with center a half. Let's now put some arrows in, anti-clockwise around the big circle and clockwise around the small circle. The reason for this is that we're now going to replace the two circles by two semicircular contours. As you can see, the arrows all go the right way around these contours. Since these two contours are obviously symmetrical, the integrals around them will have the same value so let's just look at the top one. The integral we're dealing with involves a log, so we'll have to put in a cut which avoids the contour. We can now use Cauchy's theorem, which tells us that the integral around this contour must be zero. How about the other contour? Well, that's zero in just the same way. So the integral around the top one is zero, and the integral around the bottom one is zero, so their sum must be zero. And so, combining them, the integral taken around the two circles must also be zero. So as you've just seen, the integral taken around the outside circle, anti-clockwise, which I'll call i, plus the integral around the small circle here, taken clockwise, which I'll call j, the sum of these two is equal to zero. And we can rewrite this in the form i equals minus j. But what does that mean? It says that i, the integral around the outside one anticlockwise, is minus j, the integral around the middle one anticlockwise. In other words, I can replace the outside one by the inside one anticlockwise. Now, this inside one can be done quite easily, just using parametrization. And I'll leave it to you to try after the program to show that the integral around the inside one is, in fact, just 2 pi i. It's a simple exercise, and you'll find the solution in your broadcast notes if you get stuck. So the answer to this problem is 2 pi i, which is just as well. It agrees with the, with the result we got using Cauchy's formula. 
So I've now gone through my three examples, and let me just recap on them, and I want to show how we can look at them in a slightly different way. I'm going to look at them from a rather more geometric point of view. Well, here are the three integrals that we had, 1 over zeta minus a half, 1 over zeta, and 1 over zeta plus 2, and I've got the answers written up here. Well, as you notice, they're all special cases of the integral of 1 over zeta minus alpha, where we've chosen particular values for alpha. But you may recognize this formula from unit 4. It's just 2 pi i times the winding number, where this winding number tells us the number of times that the circle C winds round the point alpha. So let's see how this fits in with our three examples. We started off with 1 over zeta minus a half, and we're meant to get the answer 2 pi i. Well, how does that fit in with here? We take alpha equals a half. So this is just equal to 2 pi i times the number of times the circle winds round a half. Well, here's the circle. There's a half, and the circle winds round just once. So the winding number is 1, and so the value of this integral is 2 pi i times 1, which is just 2 pi i. And we can do the same for the second one. The integral of 1 over zeta, well, that's just got by taking alpha equals 0. And taking alpha equals 0, we just get 2 pi i times the number of times the circle winds around 0. And here's 0. You can see the circle winds around 0 just once. So again, this is 1, and the value of the integral is 2 pi i, just as we got before. And finally, the last one, 1 over zeta plus 2. Here we take alpha equals minus 2, and then we get 2 pi i times the number of times the circle winds around minus 2. Well, here's the circle. And there's minus 2. The circle doesn't wind around it at all. So what's the winding number? It's just 0. So the value of this integral in this last case is just 0. So in all three of our examples, using this simple geometric idea of winding number, we, got, we get exactly the same results that we got before, which is just as well. <laughs>